I make people feel good about the fact. They don't care what you know. They care how you make them feel. So the fact is the rates have gotten higher. The fact is the prices have gotten higher. But it's my job to talk to them and make them feel good about the facts. Also, building that rapport with people, finding out about what they do for a living, their family, their must-haves, their wants, their needs, and then helping them understand what the difference is. You may want a pool, but your actual budget doesn't allow for it. So let's talk about what we actually need need and here's where the market is and here is what the market's telling us and helping them understand that it's okay to kind of compromise on certain aspects of buying your first home. It doesn't have to be perfect, but the market today is very different to the market 10 years ago when they were getting, you know, single family homes for a four or 500,000. So it's helping them feel good about the facts. And the number one way to do that is asking questions. They don't ask enough questions. They do a lot of telling and they don't do a lot of listening. You're listening to the number one real estate podcast in the world where we talk with real estate professionals all across North America, but their wins, losses, lessons, and stories help you win in your local market today. My name is Cody from Sheridan Street. I'm joined with Vikram Deal of the Real Estate Sales Academy. Vikram, how you doing? You're in Panama City, which is uh, for a day. You're in a hotel right now is from what I understand. Uh, why Panama City? Where are you? What are you doing? Well, you know, well, give me. Uh, so we're, our, our conscious listening is already off with your, with yeah. your, uh, not lack of listening to yourself, Cody, I'm just going to throw you out there. Yeah. But no, I'm saying you're in Panama city. Where, where are you staying? Oh, you want my, you want my exact hotel. Uh, I want, I want your, I want your address. My friend, I saw a nice little, I, I saw a nice little, uh, photo on Instagram of a uh, pool I, I, and it looks really nice. Ortiz hotel spawn casino. It is, uh, okay. I 56 E 57, which doesn't yeah. make any sense that it's two streets. Oberio Ciudad de Panima, Panima. Here you go. Okay. He, it's just waiting for you, Cody. It's, it's right. So, right. but by the time this podcast is live, come on, the time is, look at us. Okay. There you go. Looking for you. Look, time this podcast is live. You'll probably be back in Medellin. So I feel, I feel, I feel confident giving people your address today because. <laughs> By the time that you, 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 I don't anticipate you'll be there. By the time I'm, that, I'm so hoping, I'm hoping they let me back in the country. So, quick story: I'm leaving, and my friend's my friend's uh, fiance is my attorney. So she's like taking care of everything. Everything's going well. Hey, we need this stuff, you know, notarized from the U.S. Uh, okay, fine. Find the service. Found a service. Okay, great. Here's my credit card number. Well, let's wait till tomorrow because. It won't let me do it for some reason. I'm like, that's weird. Like some weird notification popped up. So the next day she calls me, you know, whatever, whoever she's dealing with. And they're like, uh, he needs to leave by Friday because his visa, like his stamps expired. So I don't technically have an extension to go back into Columbia. So I'm standing there with the lady this morning and she, you know, the immigration lady, and she's like, you don't have a, you don't have a, an extension. I'm like, no, there's one in the system. And she's like, I don't know what you're saying. I'm like, I don't know what you're saying. Say like, I don't know what you're saying. I'm like, I don't know what you're saying. I don't know what you're saying. I don't know what. And then her supervisor comes up and I'm like, oh fuck. I'm I'm literally gonna like be told to leave the country right now. And I called my friend up and I was like, hey, Jessica, can you talk to the lady? She's like, yeah, no problem. So I give the phone to the lady. She's like, what do you want me to do with the phone? I'm like, I'm like, just can you talk to her? And she's like, about what? I'm like, the extension. Bro, it was such a disaster. Like I, I just paid $20 to get a paper boarding pass on Wingo. Cause I didn't want to miss any of the meetings today. So I paid for like this, like it's like worse in spirit and sense. It was $20 for a paper boarding pass. I was like, yeah, I don't, wh- I don't understand like why you didn't know you were in the country too long. Wasn't going to ask, but because they yeah. were working on my visa, they were working on my visa. So everything was like, you know, it, it was sent in like two and a half months ago. So I didn't know that I needed to leave after 90 days, otherwise I was in jeopardy. So I, I just thought like they're taking care of it. I and mean, like, I'm not a professional immigration officer. So when they have all of my documents and they tell me that everything's good and I see her like three times a week, then I just assume everything's good. So that's why you're in Panama. That's why you, you went to Panama. 
That's why you're sitting there in a hotel. That's a very exciting. In my boxers. In your boxers. That's a very exciting story, Vikram. It's a very exciting story. I'm glad that you're safe. <laughs> I'm glad you're safe. A few, Vikram. You know what? No more story time for you, Cody. <laughs> We have a very, very great. We have a we have a special guest who was bantering with us in the in the uh, in the green room, and I was uh, sitting there thinking to myself, I'm like, I like this is going to be a fun podcast, considering the fact that like, like I never, mic. yeah, I never know what uh, Vikram's going to say on a podcast. I always like I'm always very like concerned like by what you're going to say, but uh, I've just gotten over the fact that I just never know what you're going to say. Uh, it is what it is. So I'm just going to have a little bit more personality than just let's asking tactical questions. Like you ask the smart questions. I keep people entertained. It's a good combo. <laughs> and it's a good, it's a great, com it's a great combo, but we have, uh, we have Tulane with us and, uh, why don't you give us kind of a 30 second, uh, spark notes version is spark notes is cold notes, right? In the U S cold notes is your thing. Spark notes in Canada. I don't know. Cliff notes, whatever you want to call that. Why don't you give us a high level overview in 30 seconds on how the heck you got into real estate and what you're doing in the San Diego market? Well, first of all, I have always loved real estate. I've always loved the idea of taking something, a diamond in the rough and updating it. And I got a little bit into flipping houses, but that was way, way back. I was a dance teacher. I owned dance studios at the time, was traveling the world. I actually went to Columbia. I've been to different places in competing competing so um it was just kind of like a side hobby like an interest that i had so to speak i didn't actually get into real estate until 2021 november 21 so this is my 18th month in real estate and everybody's telling me oh my gosh you're doing that many transactions and i'm not understanding what the norm is and apparently i'm doing pretty good so here i am and i'm loving it i love I, i'm this is the best career i've ever had um, let's dive right it. Let's dive right into that. Like how many transactions are you doing as a, as a single agent on a team right now? Uh, because I know a lot of agents currently that last year they really did. They did decent last year. Uh, and Vikram and I have been having tons of conversations with real estate agents that are at like one or two deals for the year when they sold 15 to 16 transactions last year. So what are you doing so far this year? And like, what is working for you? Tulane, right now, I, I bet you she's got, you know what Tulane's doing? She has the uptown lead. That's what it is. She has <laughs> good lead. She, Tulane, stop bogarting the good leads, okay? Look, I'll be honest with you. This year I've done about 17 transactions and I currently have four in escrows. It'll be 21 when they close. Last year I did 33. Apparently everybody had a hard time last year. Um, and so I just felt extremely blessed to have as many as I did my first full year in real estate, basically. So altogether over 50 transactions so far in 18 months. So what are you doing in order to attract that type of business? Cause like there's people who've been in the business for 10 years that would dream to have that type of consistency. And the, even the fact that you're saying, okay, we're, we're in 2023. There's a lot of people that are struggling in 23 because they're like, oh, interest rates are, are, are affecting buyers. Um, like what are you doing in order to attract that type of business? Obviously we know you're on a team. How is like, what, what, where is the business coming from? Is it all like, you know, your phone's just ringing and you just go and like, what, what are you doing right now? That's working. No, given the fact that I'm a new age and I don't have a huge, um, you know, database to call from of past clients that are calling me back right so i'm on a team and that's why i chose a team and my team the brand real team cars pad they're amazing they have great systems and we do get given a team leads we're on a specific programs that provide those leads referral partners and they get a percentage and then obviously you know we keep the rest so i'd say about 70 percent of my transactions have been team leads um, but they, you know, my conversion rate is, I, I think about 40, 50% conversion rate of what I get. So I do take a little bit of can, humble pride in the fact that I can convert. Go ahead. Can, can we talk a little bit about what, when you say conversion rates, 45, cause I don't know what we're basing it on. Is it, is it based off of like conversations you've had with people or is it based off of no. sit down face to face appointment? So if I sit down with conversion means they they went in escrow. So out of every 10 leads, I probably 
probably close five, four or five. Okay, let, 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 I just want to make sure we understand this because this plays a huge impact. So if you get 10 names and numbers and emails on a piece of paper, you're going to put five of those names and numbers into a deal. Well, no, they're not on a piece of paper. They come from a, a referral partner. So these are okay. vetted leads. So they're vetted. These are definitely people. This is a Zillow program, right? Let's just take Zillow as one of the referral partners. Right. Flex teams, they're all over the United States, especially right. in California. And okay. we're heading to be one of the top partners in that as the brand. So we get phone calls and they want to look at a property. They want a door opener. They might already have an agent. They might not. They might just be looking. They might just be curious. Whatever the case may be, it's your job, my job to take them from point A of I'm interested, I'm curious, to actually pulling the trigger. So for every 10 people I get that are calling to look at a property for whatever reason, I convert five of them into that, hard sales. Is that number in your office with the people that are on the program, is that the norm? Is it lower? Is it higher? It's higher, a lot higher. So let's... let's Let's, Cody, we're cool going down this path. Let's yeah, this go. is the path I want to go down because I want to talk about like what you think separates yourself from doing the 40. It feels very facetious for me to be talking how great my numbers are. Well, but if I can help others we'll, win, I'll do that. You know, We like we like facetiousness on this program. Uh, uh, we really don't, everything that we do here is made up anyways. Like who really knows what, Cody's background, he's actually never left Canada. He just changes his background all the time. Like, Happy, you guys notice he's never been tan. Like he's literally, he's not left. He's not almost stuck in Panama. Okay, got it. And I'm really not. You guys, you know that movie where they pretended to be in Ecuador in a war zone? I'm yeah. literally in my mom's basement right now. Okay, they just have a really <laughs> old house. Uh, so let's go back to conversion. Yeah. Why? So I mean, we all, most Americans don't have a really cool, sexy accent like yours. So it's got to be the accent. It's got to be the accent because it's it can't be anything else. Oh, I resent right? that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't I, resent that. I have number one accent. Do you get number two? <laughs> so, so tell us, Tulane, what are you doing so differently to connect with these shitty online leads that, oh my God, because Cody, don't all leads suck? They all suck. Yeah. So what are you doing to convert these sucky online shitty Zillow leads at 50%? They're not shitty leads. I think. Uh, a good majority are, are decent and some are nurtured and they take a while to convert. They might take six months. They could take a year. I just oh, put one in escrow that's oh, two and a half years old. Thank you. Let's but make in you general, make. beside the accent, I do tend to think I might have a few skills and up my sleeve. And I think the number one thing, A, I like people. B, I like to help people. And the saying goes, you help enough people with their problems, your problems will go away, right? You help enough people with what they've got going on and what they need, you'll make a shit ton of money, right? And that's just the number one thing. So I want to jump in a little bit. I want to jump in a little bit if that's cool. Sure. A lot of people I know like real estate. A lot of people I know like people. And a lot of people I know, right, that we've talked to really, really like helping people. But they're not selling 15 houses a quarter. They're not selling... 13, whatever, 17, 18 houses in the first five months. Not that anybody's counting, right, Tulane? No. Uh, What, like, is there something that you're doing differently? Because I know agents that have come to us. I had an agent I talked to yesterday. 32 deals in the last 24 months. This year, she's at three. So, like, if you were to analyze your process and, like, how do you conversate with these people differently than maybe what you're hearing in your office. I make people feel good about the facts. They don't care what you know. They care how you make them feel. So the fact is the rates have gotten higher. The fact is the prices have gotten higher, but it's my job to talk to them and make them feel good about the facts. Also building that rapport with people, finding out about what they do for a living, their family, their must haves, their wants, their needs, and then helping them understand what the difference is. You may want a pool, but your actual budget doesn't allow for it. So let's talk about what we actually need. And here's where the market is. And here is what the market's telling us and helping them understand that it's okay to kind of compromise on certain aspects of buying your first home. It doesn't have to be perfect. Or it might be their second home. 
or what have you. But the market today in San Diego, I'm speaking of only, is very different to the market 10 years ago when they were getting, you know, single family homes for a four or 500,000. So it's helping them feel good about the facts. And the number one way to do that is asking questions. I think agents mistakes, and I've dealt with it being a listing agent and seeing people interact with the clients is they don't ask enough questions. They do a lot of telling and they don't do a lot of listening and hearing their clients and then helping their clients navigate the market. You're the professional, you're the educator, you're a consultant, so to speak. It's your job to navigate them through and help them feel good about them buying, even though the market rate is high, even though the price point might be slightly more than they were comfortable with, presenting the risk versus the reward at all times and keeping that at the forefront of the mind. Do, do you mind real quick, just role playing a little bit of like how you would talk to a buyer? Because a lot of people say great things like this, but I don't think a lot of agents actually, they're like, oh, that sounds great. That works for Tulane, but I don't know what to say. So like you're sitting on the buyer that we, we just told you like, oh my God, we really want to buy, but interest rates are so high and we think we should wait. What would be kind of like your... I Vikram, I absolutely understand how you feel. And I do hear that from buyers in the last few, you know, couple of years quite often. Let me ask you, what exactly are we waiting for? I want to be on the same page with you. What are we waiting for? Yeah, we're just waiting for the rates to come down so that we can, uh, you know, buy a bigger house. Absolutely. Yeah, we loved it the last few years when the rates were at 2 and 3%. Um, what do you know about the market in general and what happens compared with a low rate market and a high rate market with regards to pricing? Do you know much about that? No. Okay, and that's fine. And most of my buyers don't. And that's why I'm here. I love to educate my buyers. So... When rates are low, what happens is everybody comes out on the market, Rick Ram, your neighbors, your brother, your sister, your mom, the people across the street, and the house that you want, everybody could afford it because the rates are so low, right? And so what happens is you have one house with 20, 30 people uh, interested. What do you think happens when it comes for comes to running offers? What do you think happens when there's 20 people interested in the same house? Oh, well, that's why we stopped looking last year or in 2021. We just kept getting outbid. It's crazy making. So you know what happens in low interest rate markets. Prices go through the roof. Absolutely. One thing you can change when you buy a house is the rate. Rates go up and they go down. And when they go down, you get to refinance. But you're never going to get to redo the price you paid. Does that make sense, Rick Rue? Sure. So... If you're asking my opinion, and hopefully you're okay with me sharing with you, I feel it's 100% better to buy in a high interest rate market because there's way less competition for the same property. Now, inventory in San Diego, do you know anything about the inventory here in San Diego? Super low. It's super low. So that means there are still a ton of buyers out even when the interest rates are high. The minute we cram, let's say we wait six months and the rates go down, the minute that happens, we're going to double the amount of buyers. Pretty sure you you can you know attest to that, right? You've been there, done that. Yeah, that so sense. we're going to be double competing at that point. So I, what I really want to know from you and your wife, Vikram, what are you comfortable with? What does the monthly payment need to look like? And then it's my job to find what you're looking for in a home within the price range you're comfortable with. So it doesn't matter what the market's doing. If we're comfortable right now with what the payment is and we're happy with the house, that's really all that matters. Am I right, Vikram? That's great. That's great. Um, that was great. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. No, so walk. Yeah, no, the, no, no, that, that was, uh, that was great. And it's, cl it's very clear to me that you guys probably do like with your team, you guys probably do role plays. Like, what are you like, like, I'm guessing that that didn't come naturally. I'm guessing that that ha you being able to go through that sounds very scripted uh, to me, in the sense of like you pra you've practiced that before. What what does your practice look like with your team? So it looks exactly like that, and I train them three days a week: scripts and role play, objection handling, initial calls kitchen conversation, driveway conversation, all the conversations that happen 
on the appointment and in between appointments and on every consecutive appointment. So that's at least three days per week. And I, re- I run that training. I run all three trainings. And that's exactly what it looks like. We throw an objection and we role play. What would you say is the value um, for an agent who is struggling to go and look for a good team? Not not like the teams that you know look good on paper or they, right. they sound great, but an actual solid team that is going to be able to weather this storm. What what would be like one, two, maybe three things that you would recommend to to an agent, sure. even? They've been in the industry for five or seven years. They're, they're just not where they want to be. Absolutely. The number one thing is, I believe, the education, the training that your te- that a team provides. So number one, you're looking to join a team, make sure they have training and education for you on a weekly, but, you know, multiple times per week basis. Would, you say, would there be any specific type of training that they should look for? Because there's a lot, of, a lot of teams that do a lot of training, but their agents still go nowhere. Yeah, 100%. I think it needs to be where they are really client focused and they're talking a lot about objection handling and client handling. That's number one. Um, number two would be the market. You yourself as a professional understanding what's happening in the market and being able to reframe it and again, help the client feel good about what's happening in the market. So market training is also very important. And a team that has a growth mindset. So they're open to taking on a new agent and grooming them all the way or taking on an already existing agent who's moldable and coachable and honable, um, you know, and, and enable them to grow too. So it's really important to make sure that you're with a team that understands um, the, the need for those trainings because our market is always changing. I don't care how long you've been in real estate. You, there's always something changing and moving. And if your team is not keeping in touch with that and providing that kind of training for you, it's going to be harder. So it sounds like you have a lot of um, industry knowledge in such a short amount of time. I'm curious to know, what are the, where are you tracking these trends? Where are you getting your information? And what would you recommend to an agent that, or potentially a team that wants to track the market more closely? Where should they be looking? Um, I I get a hodgepodge, to be quite honest with you, of a tons of different emails. Being an agent, we always get, you know, this is happening in the market. Tom Ferry, you know, all the big names in real estate. I read all of them. I read all of them. And still, as an agent, I know what city I'm in. I know what areas I'm serving. I have to still filter through all that information. A lot of it's hype, right? A lot of it's fear mongering. Um, and so like when rates started to go up, it was like, oh, the sky is falling. We're going to have a big crash, you know, and it, it didn't happen. We had a, a lull, we had a slow, but we didn't have a crash. And I, some, some people had a slow, Tulane did not have a slow. Uh, other, other, other people who decided to participate in the hype, they slowed down. And that's the other training mindset, because you're going to buy their story or they're going to buy yours. I am for damn sure I'm not buying anybody's story. They're going to buy mine. I don't care what the internet's saying. I don't care what people are, the supposed market experts are saying about the real estate. I know 1000% it's a fantastic time to buy. In fact, I sold more homes in November and December in the month than I did prior months. So I, I don't understand when people are telling me it's slow because it's opportunity even in that, you know? Um, so yeah, it's a hush, you know, a hodgepodge of, a ton of different articles I might read, things that come into my email, things I see online. Again, though, my job as an agent is to filter through all of that and apply it to what's happening in my market. So I'm keeping updated with the statistics of how many mar- uh, houses are on market, how long they're staying on the market to kind of get my, a pulse for myself. You've got to do your own digging. You've got to do your own educating in that regard. So, you know, like new agents or e- agents in general, right? Yeah entrepreneurs in general, especially ones that work the kind of ways that we as real estate agents work, where you're often working later at night with clients, but the daytime you're kind of taking care of business at hand. What, t- like, How much time should a typical agent spend on role-playing a day by themselves? And how much time should an agent spend on educating themselves about the market, right? So that you can you know, like the way that I think about it, if you go to a nice restaurant, 
right? You're talking 50, 70, 80, hundred dollar plus steaks. You go to a nice restaurant, you know, you sit down. If the waiter has to look at the menu to tell you what's in the dish, you feel a little cheap and you're like, ah, really? Are they writing it down? You're like, you don't remember my order? Like, we're going to tip you $200 on this uh, on this meal. Like, or, or, it feels kind of cheap. So I, 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 like, the way that I think about it is role playing is learning the menu. Yeah. It's learning how to deliver with that grace that we love. Um, education is is memorizing what's in each dish so that you can go in there is the market right here's the market here's how we deliver it how much uh, time great in, analogy. yeah how much time thank you how much time should an agent in your opinion spend educating themselves and then actually implementing that if they want to do you know above average in their market to be honest so i'll tell you two things number one doing four or five transactions a month, I'm seeing firsthand what the market's doing. Sometimes I don't want to read the freaking articles and the bullshit, you know, the media, the sensational media, because it's irrelevant to me. I'm untouchable. It's what's what I'm doing is what the market's saying. Does that make sense? But if you're not doing transactions, you're not out there, you're going to have a sense of insecurity about yourself that you're not in touch with the market. So if you're in that space where you're not doing multiple transactions on a monthly basis, I wake up at six in the morning I do, um, I do go through and read and check the emails and look through market stuff. So I do try to keep a pulse on the latest and greatest. It's not every day, but if agents don't know shit about the market, then I would definitely suggest they spend at least 30 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes a day on updating themselves in the market and the trends that are happening. Look up the latest sales in your county. Look at the median price in your county just to understand. So you can talk about that with your clients. They're like, oh, it's going to wait. We're going to wait for more inventory to come on the market. Well, it's interesting. You should say that, Mr. Buyer. I would love to do that. And I think that would be a great idea. But you know what I'm finding? You know what I, do you know what I know that is happening? X amount of percentage of homes are on the market right now. We only increased by about 1.4%. In fact, this month it's gone down about another 3% in inventory. So I would love to tell you that that, that plan's going to work, but I'm not confident telling you that because here's the fact, right? And so if you don't know that that's what's happening in your county, when people talk to you about waiting to, for more inventory, then you won't have that to share with them. It's like being in a court case. It, people can get off of murder if you if you produce a shadow of a doubt that they committed that murder. So my I'm thing- not talking about OJ Simpson today, okay? This is, a, <laughs> we're, this is a very clean podcast, damn it. This is family friendly. Oh. No, I'm serious. Like you're in a courtroom with these clients and you've got to cause a reason, a reasonable doubt so that they don't convict to, to waiting. It's your yeah, job to I, cast I, a shadow over I their want, theory. I want to preface this because I, I feel like you come from a good place. And so when you say you have to cast a shadow of a doubt, I don't, don't take this for manipulation people, sure. right? No, no, no. Manipulation. Like she's coming from a, like, if you're only listening to it and you don't see the interaction on YouTube, I, I know you're coming from a place of like, if it's not right for the person, I will be the person to tell them it's not right. 1000%. And so, you know, like just take it for a grain of salt. But when you have that knowledge Right. One, you, you're reading. So you're reading what everybody else is reading. Number two, your team that you're a part of does a lot of transactions. Three, you're interacting with your team agents every day. So you're hearing what they're saying. And four, you're producing a ton of deals. So you actually know what's going on in your local market more than the person on the news reading the teleprompter that yeah, some boots on the ground. By the time it gets to social media, it's hearsay, it's Chinese whisper, and the, the facts are skewed. There's nothing better than boots on the ground to know what's happening in market. The reason I can sit there with conviction and tell them this is a great time to buy, I absolutely 1,000% believe it. I'm not going to bullshit anybody. If I was in 2007 when shit was hit in the fan, I, I, I wouldn't have advised them, you know, I would have advised them to buy it for investments and things like that and hold on to it, that, you know, buy and hold but i wouldn't have been as as tenacious about them buy a house buy a house buy a house you know knowing that things were crashing so you've got to have number one integrity as an agent you, nobody's supposed to be bullshitting anybody 
but the I, the the reality is. Sorry, I was not on a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you state versus renting. Let's just start there. If you're renting, I don't care what city you're in, you're pissing away your money. It's going down the drain. It's a hundred percent interest. One hundred percent interest. We, we 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 have a great analogy that we role play in the real estate sales academy about renters that want to wait because the rates are too mm. high. It's just so easy. It's like, oh, well, that 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 makes sense. Like, I I could see why you'd want to wait, but I guess like I, I was wondering, like, what's the pro, what's the rebate program, or what's like the you know like down payment to buy assist program that your landlord is giving you currently for your three thousand dollars. Like, how much of that is actually going to like a down payment? Yeah, the buyer's like, well, zero. Oh, so so I'm I'm I'm. I'm a black sheep with my Indian family, but um, it sounds like you might be paying 100% interest right now to try to save 2% interest. Correct. And they're like, oh, yeah, we never really thought of it like that. Would you be opposed to us sitting down? Like, Would you find it helpful if we sat down for a couple minutes to, to go over like the three most important things I tell all of my top clients about buying or, or not buying in today's market? Would, would you find that helpful? And, you know, like 85% of the people that were like, call me back in nine days or 90 days, call me back in six months, call me back next year. They're like, well, no, that actually, we never really thought of it like that. And our clients were booking appointments left and right with people who were like, and close in. You, you asked the permission, would it be okay if, you know, there's a, the book, uh, exactly what to stay in real estate. And that's one of the biggest main phrases. I'm curious, help me understand why are you waiting? I'm curious, help me understand why you want to rent. You know, is it okay if I share this with you, you know, or has anybody really sat and explained to you the buying process versus renting? I would love to do that. Would that be okay? Instead of, I think, regurgitating and vomiting facts on the client, what you just did there was asked questions and the person said back to you. So you now have an idea of what's in their head and what they do and don't know. And I'm telling you, most people don't know much about real estate, even if they've bought before. The market has changed. Even if they bought five, oh, yes. they, even if they bought five houses, they're spread out over so. Totally. It's it's why we get on the airplane and they say, "Here's how you buckle the seatbelt," because it's not <laughs> for the people that fly every day. It's not for the investor. Right. It's for the average person who gets on five flights in their entire life. They don't right. remember how to buckle their seatbelts. Absolutely. Wrapping up here, um, I want to know. You wrapping up? Yeah, we're 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 at time. Right? Right? I know. Your clothes didn't come off. I know. We didn't even come off. We're Cody's disappointed here. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm very disappointed. But we're if gonna, we're going to start our OnlyFans channel, oh, jeez. Okay. Well, you know, like I guess that's one way to monetize. But uh, yeah, yeah. if the market crashes, Vikram, that's what we're going to do, love. I yeah, uh, I got feet built for OnlyFans. What I've been told. <laughs> okay. Well. Yeah, all those pedicures and manicures. You got this, brother. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but if somebody were to want to reach out to you, maybe it's an agent to agent referral. Maybe they're in the San Diego San Diego market, or they're in the uh, you know they're in the California market. They want to have a conversation with you. Where is the best place we can direct them to learn more about what you're up to and what you're doing? Absolutely, I would love that. Um, I have an Instagram, Homes by Tulane. We that easy. We can manage that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That the hose by Tulane. You heard it here. Uh, or just, this, fans, you know, only fans. Or only fans. Only fans. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, oh my God, it's so horrible. I can't believe I'm about to say this. We went from hose by Tulane on Instagram to hose by Tulane on Holy <laughs> Yeah. Hey, hey role, role play. Let's, no, let's role play that. <laughs> Why do you think I'm in a hotel room, Cody? Okay. Well, you know, you heard it here. You heard it here today on the Our Agent Podcast, the number one real estate podcast in the world. I want to say thank you to Lane for joining us today. But before you guys get off, Cody and I and our teams and our guests put a lot of effort into showing up and it would make, it, it would mean a lot to me. It'd mean a lot, I'm sure, to Cody. Um, if you're getting value to subscribe, to like, to leave a comment, to share. If you're listening on uh, one of the platforms that you can leave a review, please leave a review. Uh, we are trying to impact the lives of 10,000 real estate agents in the next 12 months. And we really want to see you succeed. So this is episode, I think, 
I think we're on recording number 127 or 113 or something crazy like that. Um, and we release five episodes a week. So there is literally a topic about almost everything now out there in real estate. You don't need to go far, but if it does resonate, um, you know, all jokes aside, you know, leave us a like or, or find us on OnlyFans. Link in the bio. Link in the bio. I think I want to say thank you for tuning into another episode. Uh, we'll see you all soon.